Hello everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this one is going down the AAS scientific or scientific editor series. And I'm super happy to have Giovanni Carraro with us today. Hi, Giovanni. Hi, Frank. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, all things considered. Where where are you at? Where is your geolocation? I am in Italy in a city called Padova, which oh, yeah. is in the northeast of the country. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. I've never actually visited. I've been sort of around parts of Italy, but um, not that part. So it's on my bucket list. Maybe I'll come and visit you one day. You are more than welcome. Well, thank you very much. And you're more than welcome to come to Phoenix. Uh, although you may not want to come in the summer, uh, but the winter is lovely. <laughs> so what do you like? Oh, right. So what do you, uh, what do you like to do for research? Well, um, look, at, I originally started as a, a stellar population uh, scientist. Okay. Because, uh, like Yale, for instance, is uh, home of stellar evolution. And therefore, uh, I started with a thesis on stellar evolution. So overshooting in the uh, core of solar masses or slightly more massive than sun uh, stars. But then I moved to many other topics and uh, my career now that I'm uh, around the uh, 50s, in the 50s has been characterized by sort of jumping from one topic to the other. So I have more an horizontal knowledge than a vertical knowledge. And I think it is, it was a necessity because uh, uh, working in a university, uh, you need to change from one topic to the other to be able to teach uh, different courses. And also students come from with very different uh, interests to, to do thesis. So I also, I'm also working on body simulations, uh, solar system, uh, I'm interested in dark matter, galactic structures, interstellar medium. So several different uh, topics. And indeed, in, uh, I have not a, a favorite corridor in a, a yes journal. I have several corridors, <laughs> to, be, to be honest. But uh, if I can keep on, uh, recently, recently uh, again, because of uh, students coming up, uh, showing interest, I've been working on uh, embodied simulation of uh, globular cluster and open clusters. Okay. To study the influence of binary stars in uh, the determination of their dynamical mass. Okay. And, uh, this is interesting because if we move at a bit larger masses, dwarf galaxies, for instance, they are considered to be composed mostly of dark matter. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is because the radial velocity dispersion, for instance, is very high. And you use uh, uh, that to estimate the mass. And our idea is to uh, understand the role of binaries in this uh, velocity inflation. Okay. okay. And I'm also working on uh, blue stragglers in open clusters, <laughs> yes. like ATA, and also galactic structures. So did you, did you have an overlap with ATA at Yale or something? Uh, no. No, because ATA and uh, Yale was always, I remember when I was an undergraduate, a place uh, place which uh, I wanted to visit be because uh, those, in those times, it is late 80s, there was a lot of competition between Padova and Yale, semi-convection against overshooting, for instance. Uh -huh. And uh, more or less 15 years later, I got uh, a postdoc, a fellowship. So I could uh, work a couple of years with uh, Bob Zinn, Pierre de Marc, uh, Bill Van Altena, Yep. But Alpha was already in Florida at that time. Okay. Got it. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Um, awesome. So um, sort of what is your what is your history with, with the journals? Let me ask, you know, when when was your first uh, APJ or AJ paper? 
Everybody remembers their first. Well, I, I'm not sure I remember. What I remember is a nice story. It's a nice story because I was an undergraduate and uh, my thesis advisor, Cesare Chiosi, okay. uh, when I asked for the thesis, and they, as a group, they were writing an APJ letter, which was considered something really exceptional because of the money involved in the publication and also in the, in the prestige of the journal. And I was asked to help preparing a few picture figures for the letter and I had my name in the acknowledgements. So this was my fir very first experience with AAS journal. Then of course uh, I wrote several papers for the letter for the main journal for that was the very, my very first contact. And you know, in Italy, in Padua, as in many other universities, a yes journal were considered only for very hot and important results. Because okay. normally we were used to publish in astrophysics. Correct. Cool. Uh, yeah, we got a little bit of break up on the internet, but it's okay. It's not, uh, it's not horrible. So, so uh, how did you, how did you become a scientific editor? Well, again, my life in, in intersects other life because uh, back in uh, 2012, I saw an advertisement uh, for the astronomical journal and also for the astrophysical journal. Uh, at that time, I was uh, in, in Chile working for the for ESO, the European Southern Observatory, and uh, I was considered, considered to apply for these uh, uh, positions because uh, uh, the work at ESO is uh, very duty oriented, so there is not much time to do science. And I, originally, I considered that as an opportunity to be more updated because you need to have uh, to deal with a lot of papers, read them carefully, and so you have to spare some time for doing that. And the other interest I had was uh, to get a bit more involved in the peer review process, because uh, you know, when you publish from outside, you don't understand completely how the process uh, happens. So right. I wanted to understand it a bit better, and eventually, uh, Atta went to the Astronomical Journal, I went to the Astrophysical Journal in 2012. Okay, so you've been doing this uh, eight, years. eight years plus. <clears throat> yeah, a bit more, yeah. So how many, uh, on average, roughly how many new submissions do you, do you handle? Oh. Well, I would say six uh, per week. It's a good load. Uh, coming from... Uh, from Chris Consolis, Connor, and uh, a few letters from Fred. Mm -hmm. Six is a, a good number, so you probably got on the order of 70 to 80 at any given point uh, in, the, in the mix. A bit, a bit less, 60, I would say, 60. Okay, yeah. cool. So what do you think, uh, what do you think makes for a good solid submission? Well, uh, my first uh, uh, criterion is uh, a nice title and a concise abstract. An abstract where the science case is spelled well in the sense why this topic is interesting, what I'm doing to improve or to to improve the knowledge in that topic and then what results i obtained so it you you in a say it's the scheme of the scientific method okay so i read very carefully type are verbs okay so this is my first criterion and then of course i go i go through the paper and i see that the scientific method is followed or not. Mm -hmm. 
makes to me that the structure of a paper should be like that. So if a paper spells clearly the object, the objective, describe well the method and present clearly the conclusions and the conclusion is supported, that's a good paper. Independently of the story that you want to tell because uh, every different scientist has a different story to tell and the story cannot be interesting for everybody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, fair enough. Absolutely. Yes, yes. We all have our favorite topics. Let's put it that of way. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> um, okay, so that's a little bit on the on the author side, sort of what you look for on an author side. How about uh, how about on the referee side of the house? What do you think makes for a good referee report? Well, Frank, I think that the uh, uh, both for authors and for referees because as referees. So it's just uh, to look at the same structure and content of a paper from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So the author has to follow the scientific method to tell a story. The referee has to check that the story which is told follow the scientific method. Okay. So I, I think this is, uh, I, I think this is the best criteria for writing a scientific paper. Okay. So it's, uh, um, you have a very integrated house and in that you like authors and referees to follow the scientific uh, method and then the story within that scientific method. So. Look, this is mostly because uh, I, I don't want to be negative, but in many cases, uh, every journal publish papers which do not necessarily follow the scientific method. And authors ten tend to convince people of some results without evidence. So, <laughs> Well, oh, you don't want to be doing that. <laughs> well, 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 no, but are, they, are, they are there. I know. I, I, I see them. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, I remember one of our bossy, bosses arguing that uh, a wrong paper is uh, useful because uh, it, it boosts other papers to progress in science. And I, in general, I, I agree. But uh, we cannot, I mean, accept whatever it comes because sure. it can boost the number of, of uh, submissions. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we have a duty. <clears throat> yeah, we have a duty. Uh, yeah. keep, the, keep the quality up, keep the signal to noise yeah. ratio up. Um, yeah, definitely. That's part of the job. And so sometimes you do have to make the tough decisions. Um, no, as we say, um, very cool. So is there anything else you'd like to share uh, with authors, a referee, or your fellow scientific editors about um, the journal's editorial process? Look, I, after these years, uh, I, I think uh, it was for me a very great experience. I like uh, how the journal is organized. I like uh, how the peer review process is organized. I, I love the way I have a point count on Ethan, on Butler, Butler, I use a lot Butler, and on our technical staff. So honestly, I think that we are really in good hands. And uh, there are, from time to time, some small details. For instance, uh, recently I reviewed a paper for uh, Montreal notices. Okay. And uh, as a referee, I was informed of the decision that was taken. And again, I was thanked for the work I did, which we don't know. So we already discussed about that, but it would be nice that when a paper is accepted, the scientific editor or the technical or the staff send an email to the referees saying that we eventually published 
the paper following your uh, advice. We thank you again. And something I always, I, I, I always do that. Yeah, you see, you, you, I always do that, but it is I not. Do that. Yeah, it's not generally done, and it, and it is a form, uh, say, way of uh, recognizement. We discussed a lot about that, and how to recognize referees, and right. this is this is very nice. Uh, other than that, uh, I mean, we have talked a lot in our meetings uh, over the years. Uh, I, I think uh, we have a really solid system and a solid group of uh, scientific editors. So he's referencing um, usually once a year. Uh, we get together uh, as a group uh, and we talk about the journal policies. We talk about how the journals are doing. We talk through case studies. Um, uh, where when we do case studies, just to put you at ease out there, we don't mention names. We never mention names of authors or names of referees or any of that. We don't even mention the title of the paper. So what we're really talking about is the, the process uh, and, and some of the uh, unusual cases that may come up in a given paper. So. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And also uh, what I found uh, nice is that uh, it uh, answered to one of the original uh, um, interest I had in joining the editorial team, which was to be uh, up to date and also to extend my, my knowledge. And from time to time, I mean, I get very different topic papers which uh, make my life hard, but at the end of the day, it's really <laughs> a very nice opportunity to expand yeah 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 no it's uh yeah your your motivations echo a lot of mine and that one of the reasons i decided to do this position was to stay up to date and uh i really enjoyed reading the journals and as time went on i found i was doing it less and less um which i didn't like so it was an opportunity to uh really read the journals and, and get involved in the process so yeah, I, yeah agree. I mean, on top of that, uh, it is not a really a, a huge investment of time. What I typically do is to answer as soon as possible to any email because uh, I, I found it to be the most effective uh, way to speed up the process, but doing it also because if you leave things apart and you say I work two hours on Sunday, you tend to forget it's it's complicated. Yeah. So what I do is uh, to 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 respond immediately, and I I found that in this way you save a lot of time. So it's not really a huge investment that you can keep doing your uh, normal work without uh, much distraction. Yep, agreed. Cool. 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 All right. Giovanni, thank you so much for sharing your, uh, sharing your knowledge, sharing your experiences with the journals. And thank you everyone out there and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.